and welcome to The Pledge. Now, there have been complaints this week that the popular children's books Mr. Men and Little Miss could be reinforcing gender stereotypes and breeding generations of sexist kids. Some people think this is a serious issue to be addressed and maybe even the reason Nick Ferrari is the way he is. <laughs> Others think it's politically correct nonsense. But the whole argument got me thinking about what stereotypes my fellow panellists would fit into. So I have a few books to go around. That's for Majid. That's for Karen. That's for you, Nick. And last but not least, Carol. What is this? Oh, no, I'll take this. Perfect one. I like that. You're busy. Oh, it's even got the colour of your dress on it, look. <laughs> Coming up on the programme, Majid says the left can be racist too. Carol thinks it's time we took responsibility for our own health. Nick says we've lost our sense of fun. And Karen tells Brexiteers to back off. But first, it's me. We live in a world where we expect to have more control than ever over how we live. We use apps to find the perfect partner, surgery to achieve the perfect body, I haven't, just in case you haven't, <laughs> and science to overcome obstacles to having a family. But when it comes to how we die, we have no control at all. For those facing terminal illness or extreme degenerative conditions, doctors are allowed to administer palliative care and even to stop prolonging life. But if you want to plan the means of your death, their hands are tied. In that situation, you, when you should be cherishing your last days with your loved ones, have to travel abroad like some kind of fugitive. No one wants to encourage people who want to live to die. No one wants to create a situation in which vulnerable people are coerced into ending their lives. But it's not beyond our ability as a society to create a carefully safeguarded system where those who want to die in the manner of their choosing, who are competent to decide and free of coercion, can do so. It's a compassionate and rational measure to take. And we should rise to the challenge. I remember I, um, I've discussed this on a number of times, actually, on the radio show I do, and I remember a caller who actually was elderly and not in a great state herself and was having a bit of a grim life, and she said, you wouldn't be allowed to let a dog or cat live in the condition that I have. Why can I not? And that is a pretty compelling argument. I want to bring in something that's said by a campaigner in just a moment. After you just explained to me, you, you talked about a safeguarded system. Mm. Just briefly walk me through how those safeguards would work, Afwa. Well, it is complicated. So if you look at, and there are a growing number of states and countries where this is yep. legal, Oregon, which is the model we often follow, has 68 different safeguards in place. And that, that has been in place since 2008. There's not been one case where there is any claim of those safeguards not having been followed. And the rate of assisted dying has remained stable at 0.2%. So, so this, this idea that there will be this kind of flood of people um, using assisted suicide. So, so they're quite complex, Nick, but they, 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 the, the very important one to mention is that this is about people with advanced and incurable illness. But not always. And that's usually people with six months, okay. six months left to live. So we're uh, not talking about a huge uh, range of people who okay. uh, are unhappy or ill. Final or, point from me in a moment. Just after we hear from, this is someone who's been involved, you probably know, campaign on this. Peter Saunders is chief executive of Christian Medical Fellowship. He's talking about the difference, so listen to this, the right to die versus the duty to die. And he was speaking to Sky News earlier this month. The problem is that the right, to, the so-called right to die can so easily become the duty to die. And people do feel under pressure. We all accept that in a democratic society there are limits to human freedom in order to keep vulnerable people safe. And... This is one such case. So lastly, from me for now on this, you take the case of, and it's difficult to discuss this, but there's a doctor who, as we speak, may have uh, had an assisted suicide at a clinic in Switzerland. He's 104 yeah. years old, very, very famous case, mentally agile, was able to sing part of or hum part of Beethoven's music at a crowded press conference, 104, but essentially his eyes, he's not ill. His, mentally, he's close. his eyesight is failing, life, to use one of his words, isn't the fun that it used to be. He's decided to end his life. Is that right? That's not what I'm suggesting. No, but I'm asking him. you. This is, you know, it's a di no, no, it's difficult, I'm not it's difficult, it's difficult, it's difficult for me to say. Well, it's difficult, and, and bear I'm in mind, there may I'm, be family I'm watching, not, so I'm let's... not suggesting that we implement that in the UK. So is he wrong? Yeah. I'm, I'm not suggesting we should do that, so I don't that think that it's a great idea. Can I, can I just, no, but I mean, just, it's not no, for no, me no, to say whether it's right well, Let's thing. hear from his own words, I think. You're right, I wasn't attacking you. <laughs> My uh, recent life has not been enjoyable, particularly, uh, well, after I, a, a period when I was in hospital 
and felt as if I was in prison. Once, uh, once one passes the uh, age of 50 or 60, one should be free to decide for oneself whether one wants to go on living or not. Right, so I have a lot of sympathy for what I just heard there, but I do believe that the right to die versus duty to die distinction uh, needs to be made very clear, and we have to be wary about this, because imagine somebody who is in care and is then made to feel guilty that they are a burden on the NHS, that they are costing too much, and are then pressured uh, to volunteer themselves for euthanasia. So some of the restrictions in place, I think, should involve, for example, uh, uh, some tests to make sure the person isn't suffering from any, any mental health illnesses. Um, and I think Switzerland is too lax in that regard. Um, and, but also, I think, the pressure. We need to somehow... A mechanism needs to exist to make sure that they're not being pressured or being told that they're a burden on the system. have been suggested that it would be two doctors mm. and a judge would yeah, examine the yeah. person and see that they're, they're mentally capable of the rest of it. You know, I think this country's... I think this country's shame is the terminally ill people who are in pain and whose dignity has long gone and hope has long gone are made to carry on and live agonizing lives mm. because of some outdated law and yeah. because of what I call the all life is sacred brigade. I mean this happened with my mum. My mum had two different kind of cancers when she died and emphysema. And I remember the guy in the hospice, who was a very nice guy, saying to me, but, Carol, all life is sacred. And my mother was one of the toughest women alive. And, and then, but to, in those last few months, she tentatively asked me if I would help her. Um, yeah, and, and I wish to God I'd had the courage to do that, because the next few months for her were just mm. unbearable. This was a woman whose the whole, the whole thing of her life had been dignity. My mother was a very proud woman, a proud working class woman, you know, huge dignity, and she had no dignity at the end. And for, for pink healthy people to say all life is sacred, to me well, it's just totally and utterly the, wrong. And, and you know, the, if, you, if you pull the public, the vast majority of people would be in favour yes. of some sort of euthanasia. Yeah. Yes. However, why is it that is, it has not been legalised over here? In Parliament recently it came Fear up of abuse. and it was, it was voted down quite overwhelmingly, yes. although it was a very, very, very well-debated issue. Yeah. Well, the BMA also think, opposes it. Yeah. BMA, yeah. All, yeah. The, all the doctors' organisations yeah. oppose it. And, and here's the question. The religious, of course, there are many, many religious reasons why people would not do it and would, would oppose it. And my only, my only worry is time and time again you see the advances in science when somebody is written off as terminal and you have the stories even in the past where somebody's in a coma mm. and you could you could switch off the machine and yet they suddenly but wake up and, they're right. no, and also yeah, scientific advances different. no but this is really important the scientific advances i have my uncle my great aunt my mother's cousin all died from multiple sclerosis mm. horrible horrible degeneration over years now there are advances coming up where you're getting cases where the, it's being reversed, Look, Karen, it's, it's being really, arrested, it's really so they've got hope. So they're also terminal diseases. We are diseases talking that are about people who are regarded as at the very end of their life, not people with a degenerative disease that in 10 or 15 years. Stephen could Hawking, be by the way, Stephen Hawking was given six but, months to live Stephen Hawking, in his 20s. But, he's lived for 50 he years. Didn't want to the whole die. of the he world, the whole of the world has, has benefited from this death. great science. He didn't want to and die. There's always this belief. The studies that he's done. I mean, just look at what people have lost out on. There's always this belief that terminally ill people are somehow befuddled and they don't know their own mm. mind. I think terminally ill people have a greater mm. clarity than any of us on, on how and what they, they want to end their lives. So and I think it's criminal that someone with something like motor neuron disease should be... People who will end up quadriplegics and catatonic are kept alive to live through that. Well, that is inhuman. Yeah, is, so Noel Conway is an example. He's at the Court of Appeal. He's mm. making his case. He has motor neuron disease. He can only move his right hand. Yeah. Um, and uh, is on a ventilator for 23 hours a day. I don't think that's the same that's not example. That's not, you know, that's not, so, so even with what we heard with this 104-year-old gentleman um, uh, who wanted to, to move on, wanted the opportunity to end his life, I even don't think that's the same as what's happening to Noel Conway. And with Noel Conway, I don't think it matters too much if science develops in another two, three, five, twenty years because he's in... Uh, I mean, he's suffering in dignity right now. Can I just let, uh, let you hear from the, from the Humanists UK? This is Andrew Copson. We're all going to die, right? That's a universal uh, experience. But our individual circumstances when we approach that time are all going to be very different. What could be more personal? Over what area of our existences could we need more choice uh, than this? And at the moment, a very large number of people are denied that choice. 
You know, I, I think when you look at other countries that have done this, that have successfully created safeguards, Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia, the second most popular state, is the most recent example. There, there is no evidence that it will create the risk of people being exploited or, um, or put given a duty to die. And I think that this is cultural. And there are two cultural things for me. One is the taboo around death. You know, we are all uncomfortable yeah. with talking about death. Yeah. We don't plan our death in the same way as we plan our life. And the second is this cultural... Well, no, a there's a cultural... Um, cool. There's still a cultural attitude towards dying. We still have a, an attitude of criminalization towards suicide. We still often use the we language of committing. So we still often use the language of committing suicide, which is a throwback. I don't think society has that. In 2015, a poll said that 82% of people agreed. But, you know, changing the law would allow open and honest discussions with the people who were dying, with, with doctors and with family, and that would make it less lonely. Yes, for them. I agree. So I know this, this is a really serious subject, but we do have to move on, I'm afraid. Uh, Labour peer Lord Adonis has apologised for sharing a cartoon mocking Sajid Javed's background. It showed the new Home Secretary with the caption, I just want to settle in, get organised, then deport my parents. Sajid's father has passed away. Uh, by his own rhetoric, Lord Adonis is a privileged white peer to racially humiliate the son of a Muslim immigrant merely for choosing a different political party is racism. Nobody's left-wing status immunises them from racism. And this isn't on the only example of racism directed at Javed from the left. He's been called an Uncle Tom and a coconut. Insults designed to racially shame minorities who think outside the left-wing box. Such abuse encourages political apartheid. If you call for integration, social mobility and diversity, you cannot also object along racial lines to political diversity. Now, I've never voted Conservative in my life, uh, but the left don't own minorities. So ditch the colonialism, thanks. We can think for ourselves. Majid, I completely agree with you. I think that racism, wherever it occurs, is despicable. And uh, let's just hear from Andrew Adonis, who did comment on that tweet, and this is what he said. Uh, on reflection, Sajid, I think the cartoon is too personal and in poor taste. I have deleted it. I am sorry, Andrew. And I also was on Twitter that day uh, calling out the racism that Sajid Javid was experiencing with people using those racial terms of racial abuse. And I am someone who gets trolled by racists every single day. They come from both sides, usually in my case from the far right, but I do get trolled by the left sometimes as well. And it's, there is no place in public or any other discourse for racism. It has to be called out regardless of where it is on the political spectrum. It is not a political issue. It is an issue of racism and it is completely wrong. Um, in terms of the bigger issue you raise about this idea that the left have a monopoly on the black vote, I agree with you. I think there is an imperialist attitude in some parts of the left that historically the left have enjoyed the vote for the majority of black and minority ethnic people. And it's quite an interesting phenomenon because if you think about it, so many ethnic minority communities in this country do have values that emphasise enterprise, faith, uh, strong families, social mobility. You know, they are, they are in some ways traditional small C, values. traditional yeah. conservative values. And yeah, yeah. the question is not why aren't there... Uh, black conservatives but why aren't there more and that is because the conservative party have failed to have policies and rhetoric that appeal to people from minority backgrounds even when they are natural conservatives but, uh, and this windrush scandal is the latest example of something that makes many minority people feel alienated from the conservatives so i think that is an, an, a, a problem for the conservatives and i absolutely agree we should not look at ethnic minority people with this single narrative idea they're all some lump who are left wing so, that's absolute so, nonsense well, what is what is actually highlighted all this is you've got Sajid Javid who is the son of an immigrant a bus driver's son who has done incredibly well he's got a successful business record comes into Parliament has been a cabinet minister held different positions done well in all of them and is now the first ethnic minority individual to hold one of the great offices of state home secretary and it is terrific I think it's something this country mm, yeah. should yeah. celebrate yeah, yeah. and I think he's going to do a great job because he started off straight away by saying We've had a hostile in attitude to immigration. I'm going to change that to a compliant mm -hmm. attitude to immigration. He did vote for it, so, to be so, fair. But, he did but vote also, for now, it. Here's the other point. Here, look how far we've come. In the 80s, we had only four ethnic minority MPs and one in the House of Lords. Mm. 
Today, there are almost 100 between the two houses it, uh, and a cabinet minister. And soon, yeah. we'll have an ethnic minority prime minister in this country. And one of those first oh, four see. was Diane Abbott, yeah. who was one of the first yeah. four black yeah. MPs elected, yeah. who stood yeah. up and, in Parliament, at the dispatch box, also I th condemned I think just, the racist abuse I think that just Mr. Javid, it's, it's, it's against, host uh, it's against uh, illegal immigration that there is a degree of hostility. But let's move away from the political side for a moment and just more on the sort of freedom of speech. Because I remember a few weeks ago, you and I debated a so-called Scottish comedian, yeah. and he did a video, I think, of a, a, his girlfriend's dog yeah. doing doing Heil Hitler salutes and saying... To, to the CK, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you then, as I recall, you seem to be in support of him doing a jokey video, but you appear mm, mm. to be against a jokey cartoon. Now, I might have got this yeah. wrong. So let me let me clarify that. You. Um, I think the, the distinction in that debate, if you will recall, was mm -hmm. that he, uh, this young lad, was criminalised for a terrible joke, and I made it very clear in that debate that I was... I found the joke offensive because it involved uh, shouting she kale at this dog and making it perform Nazi salutes. I didn't think it was funny, but my point was nobody should be criminalised for a bad joke. It would be the equivalent of Lord Adonis being criminalised mm, for this bad okay. tweet. And so I think that's slightly different. What I'm talking about here is I was offended at that, and I'm Final offended point at this. for me yeah. is. is is the cartoon racist or is it sentiments racist in your no, it's view? The idea that, it's the idea that one's skin colour defines what one should think politically and the, the, the notion, the tendency among some on the left uh, that uh, they own or they monopolise the ethnic minority vote. And, and let me show you Jeremy Corbyn's tweet okay. to demonstrate sure. this. Uh, because I find this incredibly racially patronising, this tweet. He's, he said that um, only Labour can be trusted to unlock the talent of black, Asian and minority ethnic people and it's that kind of you know there's a but bigotry of low expectations that is yeah. so wrong yes. so sad yes because you're here we are, here are you? 19 I'm, I'm an independent yeah, person, indeed, but, yeah. but, but it's, so, it's so sad the early 1960s we're talking about over 50 years ago that Martin Luther King yeah. says judge me not by the color of my skin but the content of my character and here we have today comments like Uncle Tom, yep. Coconut. I yeah, mean, can it's I, can repulsive. I, read, I think it's, we, it's so these? sad that right. today we, it should not be an issue at all. We've I come see. a long way. Yeah, yeah. Anyone can get anywhere, regardless of race, regardless of religion, skin, right? regardless yeah. of background. Yeah. This is an aspirational country with opportunity for all. Yep. Carol, please. Um, I find it incredible how Lord Adonis apologises for, for um, the cartoon he put out there as if it's OK now, because he said, sorry, it's really not OK. And let's just look at this, uh, some of the other vile examples of stuff that was put out on Twitter. Listen to, and this was by named Labour campaigners. Auntie Amber replaced by Uncle Tom, the most overcooked coconut in the history of coconutism, has become Home Secretary. Tory scum hiding behind a brown coconut in the, in the new Home Secretary. You know, just to say we don't know they're late. They purport to be. We Some can't of them were say. Named. Some what? of them, not these particular okay. ones, but lots of them were okay. named as a very prominent Labour campaigner said vile stuff on Twitter. And you, you know, you, you've shown that tweet from Corbyn there. Corbyn's job in all of this should have been to come out and condemn absolutely the racist abuse of, of Sajid Javid, but he didn't do that. Sajid himself, who was in the House of Commons, actually invited him to the dispatch box to do exactly that, and he didn't come. And this has been the problem with anti-Semitism. He didn't stamp on it early enough. He should have stamped on that two years ago, so three years on ago. That point, he should have stamped I, on Can I give this. Labour a right to reply? And this is uh, the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, addressing this very point. This issue of racism, anti-Semitism racism, has affected our community. We cannot tolerate it. And we can't tolerate racism in any party. Across parties, we've got to campaign I, against anti-Semitism and racism overall. You know, I um, think anybody who is genuinely committed to the struggle against racism needs to call it out wherever it happens. I am somebody who has never voted Conservative, but I'm happy to say that I stand beside Sajid Javid when he is defending himself against racist abuse. I also want us to look at the Conservative Party, where there is also racism. This isn't just an issue for the left. We had a, a, a councillor who, who uh, shared a horrific racist joke, being reinstated to win the council, and then congratulated by the chair of the party. So this is a problem in society. Okay. And, you know, just listening to you, Karen, I, I hear you, but in a way I feel like you're... This is a... We live in a country where racism is pervasive. Can this I, is not the I, only place it manifests. It is a huge so problem for all no of us. So there is no place for racism, but I also, if you flip this the other way, look at the celebration of what migration and what ethnic minorities have brought to this country. It's less than 15% of the population of this country. And look at what they've contributed over the decades. We wouldn't be 
one of the top ten economies in the world the without without <laughs> right. the contribution yeah, right. yeah. of the immigrants you over the years. You disagreeing with that. And I think yeah, we should be celebrating yeah, well, it. Uh, we're going to hear politicians saying we will not tolerate it. Politicians like point. him. Yeah. And they yeah. have tolerated yeah. it. They've tolerated well, they anti-Semitism for They don't act on years. it. That's the truth. Well, you know, they Corbyn, should act. It's not Corbyn's fault that he has members of his party that, that tweet this vile stuff. However, it is his responsibility to talk about it and to stamp it out by, by sacking members from the party. Nick, who do this? To your, to, to your yeah. earlier point, I think the key here for me mm. is to assume the way somebody will vote based on their skin colour and then to consider them somehow treacherous to their ethnicity or identity if they don't toe that line yeah. is the issue. Yeah. Um, voter, voter patterns are a lot more complex than uh, reducing them down to one single issue. So, for example, Sajid Javed um, and, and actually generally minority voters who vote Conservative uh, may have overlooked some of the historic racism they believe or allege could have existed in the Conservative party because they may have been more disgusted for example by the anti-semitism in the Labour Party but people make multiple calculations when they're voting and it isn't only down to one issue and I think that's the nub of it for me to reduce okay. somebody down to you know their ethnicity and then define their political allegiance based on that for me is okay. racism okay we've got to move on um, to me next question in a country where one in eight women will get breast cancer why would we need to be reminded to go for a mammogram Yes, the NHS sends out computer-generated letters, but should it have to? Should it really be the state's responsibility to remind every woman over 50 to get their breast checked? I thought I was missing something when the news broke, that a computer glitch meant 450,000 women between 68 and 71 hadn't been sent a letter calling them for a checkup. But surely it's a woman's responsibility to check when their last mammogram was. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in the UK. It kills 11,500 women every year. So why would we trust our lives to an NHS computer? Fear-mongering, whipped up by the media, said 270 women may, just may, have died prematurely because of these missed scans. Despite the fact that 72% of all breast cancers are detected by women finding a lump or other symptoms themselves. Yes, every cancer death is a tragedy. But doctors say it's impossible to know whether those missed cancers would have been curable if detected. But if this glitch has done anything, it should be to jolt women into taking control of their own checkups. We only have one body, girls. Let's look out for it. Carol, everyone would agree that people need to take responsibility. The, the reality is around the world, there are public health departments. Governments have a, a role in public health to inform people about situations, about taking care. That, so one is to educate people and not everyone is aware of what the symptoms are of various types oh, of cancer. For example, no, so, no, 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 so people always need to be educated and reminded. That's point number one. Point number two, there is no question that prevention is much better than cure and the and the cost of treating someone if they've been diagnosed with serious stage cancer is much higher from a cost point of view let alone the suffering point of view now my colleague Andrew Lansley um, who used to be health secretary is now in the House of Lords he has written about it openly he's been diagnosed with bowel cancer mm -hmm. and he says if only it is made compulsory that people have this bowel cancer screening because the statistics are there well even if it's there you know only 59 percent of people take up the offer of free screening so there was you're absolutely right people should take up the responsibility but then look at the difference when something is detected at stage one it's almost a hundred percent of them are cured but if they're detected at stage four then only 10% okay, can survive. I, can, can so, I, you know, the hmm. earlier these things are detected, well, okay. we would be saving lives. Right. Can I just say something? There is no such thing as early detection with breast cancer. Cancer has been developing for eight years before it's ever picked up by a mammogram. And, and, and <laughs> going back to my point about women taking responsibility, women have an education and knowledge. Well. Women have known since, since the mammogram um, breast screening program was brought in in 87, I think it was. Women have been told since then that they're entitled to go for a, a free mammogram every three years. Women over 50 know that they're entitled to that. The idea that, that you just wouldn't bother... I, I don't understand women who hadn't been called after four years. You know, I, 
I, I can talk about the dangers of mammograms later. I mean, doctors are now questioning whether they're actually good for women, that they don't cause more unintended harm than they cure. And you're, you're wrinkling your eyes, but there's, there's a massive... There's a, there's a body of doctors out there who think that it's dangerous. The amount of radiation that a woman gets in one mammogram... No, but the, no, listen, let me finish. Weigh up the radiation versus... Let uh, me finish. No, no, spotting the amount something of, that'll, you know... It, but, it's, but by then, it's already yeah, developing. So, and there is, there, is no, there is no evidence that the, that the most dangerous and advanced cancers have been prevented by screening. I need, to bring, in, I need to bring in the health secretary oh. because he's addressed this directly. This is Jeremy Hunt. Many families will be deeply disturbed by these revelations, not least because there will be some people who receive a letter having had a recent diagnosis of breast cancer. We may, must also recognise that there may be some who receive a letter having had a recent terminal diagnosis. For them and others, it is incredibly upsetting to know that you did not receive an invitation for screening at the correct time and totally devastating to hear you may have lost or be about to lose a loved one because of administrative incompetence. I'm sorry, Carol, but I'm, I'm totally not with you here. The reality is the NHS estimates that for every 200 women screened, one life is saved. We have a system where there is screening that is organised centrally and women are sent letters. If we didn't have a system and it was up to each of us to monitor our own screening um, intervals, that would be different. We have a system that we are told to rely on. If, I don't know if you've ever tried to get a screening of your own volition. We're told to rely on a system that messes up regularly. Well, that's, that's why this is, NHS. And that's this is where why we this come to a stop just briefly because we should all wish Lord Lansley a full recovery as uh, Karen as you said and not every woman Carol is perhaps as strident or robust as you should they should they then start thinking where is my letter why haven't I got it of course they should but they're not all a lot of people believe it's all gonna when they go to hospital they just are almost intimidated hold on I want to bring in a clip for and I stress an NHS nurse I stress the fact that this woman for whom this story is all too personal she used to work in the NHS she's a nurse Patricia Minchin she is now 75 and she's one of hundreds of thousands of women that you refer to who never got that letter in the beginning, I was kind of thinking, oh, how disappointing it was that, you know, I missed that 70-year-old mammogram because basically it, it could have made a difference. Maybe I would get angry in the future if the treatment, you know, wasn't successful because my whole family went through the whole journey as well. My husband took me to every appointment, you know, all the hospital visits, the scans, you know, blood tests, the whole thing it is really quite intensive. And as we now know, unfortunately that woman has suffered, so we wish her as well a speedy recovery. And the, just, Karen, I want to go to Magic, but, but the way Jeremy Hunt spoke, you spent far more time in the Houses of Parliament than I have. The level of contrition that he showed, I think, shows how badly the government take it. I think it's that, that's the point there. It's on that note, it's what I was trying to say earlier, that actually um, it's, regardless of whether we think women should take more responsibility or not, there's been a systemic failure here in the system for a service that the government has assured women they'd be provided, and that service hasn't been provided. That's, a I think, a completely separate, separate topic to whether women should be vigilant for themselves. Of course they should. You know, they should be they should. examining themselves regularly, which is yes. what the doctors advise. And on that note, I'd just like to say, from some of the earlier conversation, it is very important to state that we aren't medical doctors on no, this we're table. Not. And so um, I would encourage uh, viewers not to take our advice as if it's professional medical Absolutely advice. Right. Uh, 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 Breast Cancer now have released a statement on the systemic failure that I was talking about. And I think, I think that's the key point here, uh, and that's what the Health Secretary has conceded to as well. We are deeply saddened and extremely concerned to hear that so many women have been let down by such a colossal systemic failure, uh, that hundreds of thousands of women have not received the screening invitations they've been relying upon at a time when they may be most at risk of breast cancer is totally unacceptable. For those women who will have gone on to develop breast cancers that could have been picked up earlier through screening, this is a devastating error. But it's the first half of that statement that I'd like us all just to, just to focus on for a second, and that, that is that assurances were made that the system was in place and some women may have been waiting for a letter thinking but that my that, point that is Majid, we know that systems yeah. fail all of the time this was that this was a computer algorithm that failed mm. and what all I'm saying is that people we you know we value our lives our breasts our health it, it 
there's a responsibility on earth. Women must be aware that they haven't been called. And women know that they can go to their GP and say, I haven't had a letter. I need to be referred for my mammogram. Mm. And, and I think we all have to, you know, we don't get letters to go and get your kidneys checked or your lungs checked. You know, we look for symptoms ourselves. We do have a certain responsibility. Of course, I'm yeah, not but there's, no one is, no one is denying state. what you're saying. Yeah, but yeah, the yeah. reality is we have a national health service that we're all very proud of. We're all very grateful that we do get these reminders. You get reminders you get over a certain age to have a colonoscopy or whether it's a, a mammogram. And I think it's wonderful that we have a health service that cares for us, that reminds us, that offers us that this is available. We can't depend and, 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 on it for our lives, we should, Karen. We should be I, able to. We shouldn't be able to. We it's should. a massive, unwieldy organisation that doesn't always I just work. can't understand why, why you... Why put your whole faith in an organization that we have seen, because of various factors, because of money, because there's not enough staff, sometimes make mistakes? So why would you trust your life to that? I just can't understand why you're victim-blaming. The reality is victim the system blame. failed. Let's talk about why the system failed, how we can improve it. Not that it's the fault of women. Some of you may have died it's the fault of because women. the system failed. I've stop putting serious... words into my mouth. I am saying it is a, yep. a responsibility exactly right. for women to actually think about their health. You would think about if you had a pain in your gut, you would think it was maybe your bowel. You'd go and have it checked. In but the, the same way, we is check that our you may breasts. not have any Second symptoms. Major. These screenings are meant to be preventative, detecting Seventy-two percent of cancers are detected by women finding symptoms themselves. And the reason we have a, a system of screening is to, is to detect the ones that women so have. I, and I think I think these are distinct debates. That you know whether or not screening as a routine procedure is a good or bad thing is a debate doctors are having right now. But that's different to a systemic failure, which is different to wondering why some women didn't inquire. As to and why that's why the government, I think this is balance between yeah. the government informing people so that they do spot symptoms themselves as far as possible, offering the screening that will prevent and detect, and then of course the treating screening required. It is right. three Where's separate things that are required. It's time to screening pull the screen, it. it's time to pull the screens down on the screening debate with the moral being, if you are in any doubt about your health, seek advice from a qualified medical professional. You're watching The Pledge on Sky News. Up next, I'm saying, if you ban someone putting their mug on a mug, the only mug is you. You happen to be watching me now and are in desperate need of a lifeboat anywhere near Whitby in North Yorkshire, all your luck. Don't expect the brave men and women of the RNLI to save your life anytime soon, as they've lost half a dozen of the bravest of the brave in a row over coffee mugs. Yeah, talk about a storm in a teacup. <laughs> in the sort of regular office banter and nonsense that relieves the gruelling tedium of work life, a couple of lifeboatmen at Whitby exchanged gifts of mugs featuring images of them mocked up as semi-naked women. Now, some ghastly, pious, senior female member of, sta of staff declared this could be a safeguarding risk if a visit by schoolchildren alighted upon the crockery. So the two members of staff were sacked. Four others have quit in protest. Now, much may be unknown about the case. However, as the locals at Whitby say, this has totally compromised the life-saving abilities of the lifeboat. Surely this row is nothing more than a mug's game. The king of puns. Thank you. Well, <laughs> well this, this case has confused me because from we don't know much about it, but from what we do know, uh, we, d we know that one of these uh, men that was uh, stood down, as the uh, RNLI has said, was volunteering for them for 15 years. Yeah. It's a volunteer organisation, it's a charity. Well, They've saved uh, so Can a mug lives. be inappropriate, Magic? No, no, that's why I'm saying I'm a bit confused. Because I think on there's, only one, there's only one way in which I can understand what's gone on here is, is, is that it, if it was targeted abuse, if one of the female uh, other volunteers, had made a complaint, but we, we haven't even heard that. No, there are two, the two female colleagues who said they weren't offended. Who said they were not offended. Yeah, so that's why I'm so confused. Now, uh, you know, just to give the benefit of the doubt to the RNLI, let's hear, well, let's read their, uh, okay. their, what they've said about it. They've said these were serious conduct issues which go beyond media speculation around the production and use of offensive mugs. One volunteer was stood down for social media activity which targeted a member of the RNLI staff without their knowledge and used graphic sexual images 
which went far beyond banter. As a responsible employer, we cannot take this sort of behaviour lightly. The lifeboat station should be an environment where people are treated with dignity oh. and respect. But uh, I'm unaware as of yet of any complaint being made by any female staff member, no. which is what's confusing me here. Mm. Is it somebody becoming offended on somebody else's behalf, you which know, would be is, different? Since... Which would be different to targeted harassment? Since this is... Nick is groaning uh, at yeah. the idea of uh, colleagues being treated with dignity and respect, I've decided to waive those rules for you, Nick. Have a look at what, uh, what we prepared for you. What? Oh, it's a rack full of mugs. There you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Fabulous. We know so that was you by we the know shower. how to direct a bit of harassment at, at colleagues as well. <laughs> look, the thing is, you know, um, there, there, there is a realm of banter that can happen yep. in the workplace, but the RNLI, and we don't know the facts, but no. they've made it very clear that what happened that we don't exactly know went beyond that, that it was directly targeted at a female staff member. It wasn't just a mug. There Why was social media us, activity. Why wouldn't they show well, I don't know, Carol, but, but I do know that one in three women in the workplace in Britain have experienced sexual harassment at work, people making unwanted jokes and unwanted... Define comments. that sexual... At the lowest level, what is that sexual harassment? It can be... Would it be, it can be pass me the stapler, darling? It can be comments about their body or their sexuality... It can be pass me the stapler, darling. It could also be that image on the mug right there. The, That's part the, of the problem the with that statistic. Is, four out of five of them don't yeah. report it. Whether, whether you objectively deem it serious or not, they feel uncomfortable and they're not reporting it because we still have a culture in the well, workplace... Two cabinet where women who've, who've resigned as a as a result of it, supposedly. Yeah, and quite rightly. We still, we still do not have a culture know, where this, this is taken about, seriously. This is about mugs. You know, we haven't seen anything yeah. that the RLA has It's not. It's has about happened. social media but, activity. But, you know, this, is, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the political correctness again. Our public institutions have been hijacked by politically correct idiots. And what the PC True. mob don't seem to get is the consequences of what they're doing. The consequences of this is that... The, Who's going to be saving lives in Whidbey now? Yes. Six men down. Who's going to want to join that team again? The whole community well, I mean, has ah, been... You've the, got to let me finish. And the whole no, community will be alienated. The Can I just finish? Let, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just finish, because well, Carol's yeah. on a roll. OK. On. The whole community is now, is now against the RNLI. Yeah. RNLI workers all over the country are considering quitting over this because they're so angry about it. And, and, and let me finish. And okay, donations finish. to the RNLI, people are saying we will never yeah. contribute okay, no. again. So what good did this do? In a moment, Kafwa, you wanted to come in then. No, I was going to say the consequences of this are going to be that when people and so bravely what volunteer with the RNLI in future, they'll know that there is a zero tolerance <laughs> policy of sexual harassment in the workplace, which oh, is the only way on, that I just can tackle we'll a get problem that is pervasive. Let's <laughs> really, let's keep this absolutely in perspective. Yes. We are dealing with the RNLI, an institution that has saved over 150,000 yeah. lives, that is reliant entirely on volunteers yes. Yes. and on public donation. Yes. The public loves the RNLI, they support the RNLI, we appreciate the RNLI. So I think this should not overshadow the great work that they do, including these individuals. But with the it's, it's a bit harsh, isn't it, right? So, but based on where I, said, where I said you've got to concede what Carol said is that, you know, Whitby's lost six volunteers, which That's is what Carol, they were. Who have 15 what, years' hold experience. On. <laughs> hold on. Not that, making your point up. Hold on. And so what I was saying is that surely there could have been some measure taken, like, for example, slap on the wrist, don't do this again, in the absence of a woman so, specifically complaining. That's supposedly what happened initially. But to, to sack them? To sack but them. we don't but, you know. know. No, you know, Nick, no, we, in his we intro, know, Nick, where there hasn't been a complaint. Nick, in his intro, said that there was a ghastly, pious female yes. staff yes. member. Yeah, yeah. How do you yes. know she's ghastly and pious? How do you because know that she hasn't she seen something said unacceptable these mugs would and corrupt out? young people? How, you don't how, know what she, she said. Hold on, mugs. hold on. What we do know is that she said it was quotes inappropriate crockery. Afwa Hirsch, <laughs> how can crockery be in? <laughs> now even you, exactly. even you are laughing. She knows. She just posted one of you on TV. So yeah, there's a serious point to demonise the woman who calls this out. Okay. Is perpetrating the situation we have, Can I give... where women Here's feel intimidated from bring it coming so forward. So he laughed when cases. you put that mug on, on the screen. He laughed. Yeah, of course. Now it appears, from what we know, that no specific female staff has come forward yes. to complain. We... So it's the equivalent but now. Is the equi... that female you staff affected don't want to Let Majid finish. Let Majid finish. It's the equivalent now of somebody else getting offended on Nick's behalf while he's saying he wasn't offended and kicking you off this panel show. Oh, I like that idea. I'm going to convert into a. That's what it is to have happened. The, the RNLI pay the thick end of 42 yes. grand for a safeguarding officer. And so they have to busy themselves with something. So they've busied themselves with, That's a good point. with two mugs, with naked we women. It's the point know. Richard Littlejohn made in his we column. They can find 42 that. grand. You know, we, we know that, that it's very clear we don't know all the facts. We don't, we, know. We don't know what actually happened. <laughs> but there is this balance between banter that has always taken yep. place in the workplace forever. Mm. 
and political correctness going too far. And yeah. if this I... is a case of political correctness going too you, far. Oh, so you, if, oh, you're on my team? For, it, we, when we know all the facts, we don't know as long the facts. Never mind about that, 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 that Karen. We all drink mugs with your face on them. <laughs> we're back here. Afwa is offended by what you're ah. about to see. Ah. This is rowers at Warwick University every year produce a naked calendar for charity. What do you think about these pigs, Afwa? It's fine. I'm, well, not, I'm fine. not some prude who can't handle nudity. Oh. What I have a problem with... This woman at the RNLI yes, was. Yes. What I have a problem with is behaviour that makes women feel uncomfortable in the workplace. We have a long history of that in Britain. We have a long history of women so, so men not feel able... uncomfortable by that in the Well, workplace. fine, let's, then let's raise it. Well, I, 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 I mean, putting Nick's face on a mug might make him feel like... A, that's the I think that bod looks fantastic. Might have complained so about and, now, like and now he's found a way to get me kicked the off the place. The only way we know that, what you said, and you're correct in saying that, is if Nick took offence at that and then made a complaint. Yeah. That hasn't happened. Is it right for a superior to decide on his behalf that he's been made to feel uncomfortable and then kick you off Do the panel? You know panel? what worries me here is that we don't know the facts, and that so in the absence of really knowing the facts, there's this instinct to assume that the female staff member who reported you've it is got, ghastly and pious. You've got to get into to tabloid minimize, journalism. Don't minimize, worry about the facts. To minimize. <laughs> we do know. It's not, well, we, do, we know he it wasn't the female staff that reported it. It was a boss <laughs> who found it. We've got, we, we've, got to, we've got to stop there. Yeah. Um, I'm next after the break defending my right to do my job. <laughs> <laughs>
you've of debates. You've got to talk about my attendance okay. record in total. It's far higher than 21%. Well, I'm talking about so don't, the debates. Don't get false facts. 21%. Thank you for really, really in, 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 insulting me personally. And you, of course, are an it's elected not in, individual, it, aren't you? It's not insulting yeah, so you so personally. So you're anyone unelected. who has a say has to be elected. Do you realise the role of the House of Lords? If we lost... Yes, if and we you're lost, contravening your role. If we lost the House of Lords in the form that it is, and if you have an elected House of Lords, the whole dynamic will change. At the okay. moment, the Commons has the final say, and we know that. Our job is to rev revise, review, scrutinize legislation, and make the you Commons think again. So, so we're not, oh, we're we're not enemies of the people, we're yes, guardians yes, of the nation. You nations. are not let's pull, let's, let's, let's pull back a, a, a second. I, I just want to say that um, I don't think you're my enemy or anybody's enemy, and I don't think you're my enemy. I'm talking I think, about the House but of Lords. No, I know, I just think it was slightly a bit personal, but it's I am with personal, you on the... It's not personal, it's about the House okay, of Lords. Me, me, Karen yeah, is a Lord. Let's, let's, All right, I'm with you, and I always have been, by the way, on the need for the House of Lords to reform, and I don't allow that view of mine to swing or sway depending on the political climate. I'm very consistent in that. I do believe the House of Lords needs to reform. Absolutely. And I, and I think that, actually, it's very interesting in this debate how the tables have turned, because it's always been uh, Liberals with a small and big L that have been calling for the House of Lords to reform, but now suddenly Conservatives are calling for it. In fact, two-thirds of the public are now calling yes, for it. Yes, Which is, a, I think, a fantastic development. There was a referendum on that tomorrow. It would be a landslide. Yeah, but the is different about abolishing. So, so, yes, this is yes, about reforming. Reform is different it's a very abol small minority yes, who want yes. to abolish the House yeah, of Lords. People realise the value of the institution. Reform is different to abolition. Um, reform would include an elected second term. <laughs> with longer terms. But well, what I will say... <laughs> What I, well, the last thing I'll say, and yeah. the last thing I'll say, is that I think um, while they're there, before reform yeah. happened or has happened, it is important that they're allowed to do their jobs, which is scrutinise legislation. Scrutinise, yes. not over time. All right. Scrutinise. Yes. 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 Right. My lord, shall we move the debate on a little bit, yes. Karen? Because I wonder if I can refer you to the front page of today's uh, Daily Mail. No, it's not the picture of Her Majesty Lord right. over. Isn't there surprise. a danger? Isn't what there a say? danger that? with what you and your colleagues are doing. Most of the time, what you and your colleagues do is a very valuable exercise. And don't take this the wrong way. You largely go unnoticed. You largely go unnoticed and it carries on. If you continue to do this, are you not concerned there could come a tipping point where the level of anger that we've seen, which is fair enough, but perhaps a tad personal, but the level of anger that we've seen from Carol actually starts to really put in jeopardy the importance of what a second chamber does. And I know you, like me, regularly collect copies of this newspaper. Indeed, okay. this one, this one yeah. featured you earlier. Same uh, the newspaper. House of the Balanced as so, ever. So, so this doesn't mean... It, hold on so this doesn't mean it reflects the whole tone, but you, you should be a revising chamber, absolutely no question. I think in this case, Karen, you're in danger of becoming a rewriting chamber in that you want to rewrite the not, whole. Not at all. Go because, ahead. Because what, if you think about what we've done, every piece of legislation that comes from the Commons goes through all the processes and then comes to us. The universities bill last year, we had 500 amendments in the House of Lords because it's with our experience, with our expertise, yeah, yeah. with several Abs people, yeah, leaders yeah. of Absolutely. universities, giving their input that helped to improve that legislation that then goes back to the Commons. And it's up to them to accept or not. Here, if you look at the 14 amendments that we won, every one of them, there's a reason to give Parliament a meaningful say. The government is saying, We'll, we'll give you a vote at the end on, on the final deal or no deal, but if you don't agree, we crash out on WTO, you? Well, or WTO rules. I'm sorry. That is, the public will not accept that. We're seeing a meaningful vote means if Parliament doesn't agree, it means maybe going back to negotiate or maybe even remaining in the European Union if that's the best option. I just think it's so interesting because Brexiteers voted for Britain to retain and re-seize uh, re its sovereignty. Mm. So now we have the sovereignty of British institutions, notably the two Houses of Parliament, suddenly they don't like our sovereignty anymore because it produces a result that's not what they say they want. The reality is you cannot cast the House of Lords as subverting the will of the British people yes, because yeah. we don't know whether the British people voted for a hard or soft Brexit because the question wasn't asked. The question was, do you want to remain or leave the EU? No one was asked about whether they want a customs partnership the Lords get um, way, or to reign in the single not apparently. And, that, that, and that's not what people voted the for. The bottom line is, um, if you cared are, so much about parliamentary sovereignty, why did, why did, and a lot of the guys in the Lords said, gave away parliamentary sovereignty 40 years ago when you, to Brussels. You've given it away. You, Listen, you we, so by the way, the Parliament, this whole nonsense about giving away sovereignty, you do you realise we've had the ago. best we've had the best of both worlds? But I have seen with 12 years, 12 years I've seen the legislation that affects our day-to-day -day lives is made in our Parliament. Mm. Very little of it is the ECJ having the final say. Most of our cases are resolved in our courts 
at the ultimate, the Supreme what Court. What you guys want? So this is nonsense about sovereignty. I think, sovereignty. I think, it's fair, I think it is. It's, it's fair to say that until reform happens, and this may well encourage reform. You're right, Nick. Well, that's I, and point. I'd yeah. embrace it wholeheartedly. It's about time. But until reform happens, there are genuine questions that need to be asked about the way in which we Brexit. To our first point, and how the House of Lords need to be able to do their jobs. Now, some of these genuine questions come around to the arrangements between the customs union and Britain and the single market. Even even our foreign secretary was pressed on this earlier. Let's let's uh, watch what he had to say about it. The Prime Minister has made it very clear where, uh, as she said in her Mansion House speech, we're coming out of the customs union, we're coming out of the, of the single market, we're taking back control of our, of our laws and uh, But uh, if and you all don't, will you resign? As she said, we're coming out of the customs yeah. union, we're coming out of the single market. It's a core issue And I have no doubt that uh, that's what uh, she and uh, the rest of the government are going to deliver. And so here there are, there are serious questions, and I think, Carol, all of us can agree that they are quite substantive issues, that, that there seems to be a confusion, even at Cabinet level, and until, until this reform that you are so passionately arguing for, that I'd back you on, um, <laughs> happens, I think Karan should be allowed to do his job so, so, without so, being yeah, insulted. So, and also, look at the reality. Is the government doing a good job in negotiating You're with Brexit? Them doing so let's have a look at the statistics. You're let's la let's have a look at the statistics. 56% of people think the government is doing a bad job Oh. And only 28% think they're doing a good job. So now it's our job as Parliament. So now we respect people's it's polls, Karen. Our, it's, <laughs> our, it's our job as parliamentarians to challenge government continually on a day to day basis. They're doing their job. And, they, and they're not. He's, a, he's right. Brexit they're was not jobs. a blank check. It was not leave on any terms. Now, we've all made promises we can't keep. Afwa never gave me that mention in her book that she promised. <laughs> but this week, we take our hat and everything else off to snooker world champion Mark Williams, who was forced to make good on a bet to hold the winner's press conference naked if he made it that far. He's not only a sharp shooter, but our straight streaker yeah. of the week. And he's also promised that if he repeats the feat next year, he'll cartwheel naked. I hear um, a certain Nick Ferrari could offer him some <laughs> tips on that. Well, I, don't know, I don't know where that comes. All, all I was going to suggest, uh, Carol, is that uh, as and when his lordship and his colleagues and those in the other place deliver a, a good Brexit, will you do an episode of the pledge, start naked as the day you were born? No. Is, oh, well, there we go. It's only <laughs> it, you know, you know, we just don't want to put off, you know, the viewers that we've got. No, no. It's all right for the, you know, the snooker player, but it's not all right for a mug, though, of course. That seems to be the problem. Of course, it? yes, and naked calendars. Indeed. OK, that, that's all we've got time for this week. But if you'd like to join the debate, just search for The Pledge on Facebook or Twitter. Thanks for watching.